Hello everybody, my name is The Goldman, and today we're gonna talk about The Mandalorian Season 1. When this show was first announced, let's just say I felt nothing. The people behind the camera had my complete trust though, so I was optimistic to see the direction of the show. We got a bunch of teasers and trailers, but there was nothing there to get me super hyped for the show. I said to myself, man, this show is going to have a hard time capturing the attention of the casual audience. Honestly, the aspect of this show that excited me the most was Jon Favreau mentioning the First Order in his announcement post. So with the marketing of the show being lackluster, how did the entire first season of the show hold up? Did The Mandalorian Season 1 captivate audiences during a time where Star Wars was struggling? Did it add anything to the lore of Star Wars the same way The Clone Wars and Rebels did? Did it prove that Star Wars live action could work on the small screen? Would Gina Carano become a strong whammon that a certain section of the fandom would call a Mary Sue, let's all put on our helmets, discriminate against droids, get frozen in carbonite, and discuss The Mandalorian Season 1. Up first, world building and tone. The way I used to do these types of videos was that I would just go through the entire season episode by episode and just give my thoughts on them and why certain elements worked or didn't work. I now feel that approach was kinda lazy. So for the entire season, I'm gonna focus on three different aspects. Each part is going to be its own video. Part 1, which is this video, is going to focus on the world building and the tone of the season. Does it feel like Star Wars? Do the sets immerse me in the world? Are the designs unique? and interesting. I think this is such an underrated aspect of Star Wars that I want to highlight more on this channel. The second part is the characters. Now I want to emphasize that analyzing the characters is different from analyzing the story, which is the third part by the way. Analyzing the characters will be more about the characters' personalities, how effective the storytellers fleshed out these characters, and do the characters evoke the right emotion in me. The story is more so about the message, what are the storytellers trying to convey, how are the characters' arcs impacting this story. There are plenty of movies that I think have really well developed characters but have a pretty shitty story, and then there are movies that have shitty characters but an interesting story. That's the biggest difference between part 2 and 3. The way I'm going to analyze world building and tone of the season is by splitting it into three sections. The first section will cover chapters 1 through 3, the second section will cover chapters 4 through 6, and the third part will cover chapters 7 and 8. So let's begin with chapters 1, 2, and 3. How do these episodes feel? Do they feel like Star Wars but smaller? Am I immersed in the world? What is the world building like in these episodes? Star Wars to me always felt like a grand epic. Each trilogy began with our main characters in their isolated worlds, but as the trilogy began they were thrusted into adventures that took them to places and battles that had galactic importance. Each Star Wars movie had epic battles with dozens of different vehicles and starfighters that added so many layers to what was going on on screen. It's so dense, every single image has so many things going on. With this show being on the small screen, I was curious yet nervous about how Star Wars would translate to something much smaller in scale. The Clone Wars and Rebels had the benefit of being animated, so while the graphics were amazing, it wouldn't cost a shit ton of money to create large scale battles and locations like it would with live action. Was this a concern? Yes, but a small one. So how did The Mandalorian handle the budget of a TV series? series and not a movie. Well, darn tune, the series did a fantastic job. From the very first shot, The Mandalorian sets the tone of what kind of show it is. Every Star Wars movie has began with a shot in space, panning down towards an entire planet, showing off the scale of the Star Wars franchise. The Mandalorian begins with a shot of a device that looks like an HDMI adapter. Now this is not a bad thing. Jon Favreau knows this show is going to be significantly smaller in scale, so let's set that tone right away. Also the scenery of the worlds that we see aren't these giant ass city planets that have moving pixels everywhere. It's so dense, every single image. They are just these small one of the muck towns that are filled with everyday people.
Star Wars has always had a solid grasp of making their settings feel really old school, while still feeling like it's in a universe with planet killers and laser swords and wide boys. In the first 15 minutes, our main character goes to two different bars, and these aren't the trashy bars you would go to if you're a horny 19 year old college kid trying to find some hot ass. These are western bars. You walk in and only the hardest people are there, just chilling and drinking. There's a great quote by John Favreau that proves why he gets Star Wars so right. He doesn't take inspiration from Star Wars itself, but the things that inspired Star Wars. The Kurosawas and the Flash Gordons of the world. You know how when you watched The Force Awakens for the first time and they went to Takodana to that bar in Maz's castle and you were like, oh shit, that's basically the Moss Eisley Cantina but in 2015. You don't get that vibe with The Mandalorian. This is just a regular bar that seems like it belongs in the Star Wars universe. Another thing I love about the scenery here is the diversity. That's right, I just dropped the D word. The Moss Eisley Cantina was so awesome because there were all these different aliens. Some looked like humans kinda, and others looked like some wacko shit. I like how we see familiar aliens and some new ones. Besides the bars, everything in this episode feels so lived in. The place where Mando meets the Imperial client feels like this back alley room where really sus shit goes down. The walls are dirty, the stormtroopers are dirty, it really gives us the vibe that the Empire has fallen from grace and now they're trash. It makes the world feel real, which is essential for a fantasy series like Star Wars. If I had to choose a single aspect of the world building here that I love the most, it would probably be with the Mandalorians themselves. They aren't the badass Mandalorians we saw from the Clone Wars and Rebels, these are Mandalorians who are defeated, forced to hide in the shadows. A controversial direction that Favreau and Filoni decided to take was to make our main character and his sect of Mandalorians different from the ones we are used to. The DNA of what makes a Mandalorian is still there, the differences obviously come in the extremity of their rules. These Mandalorians are banned from removing their helmet, they follow much stricter codes, and they have their own motto. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. Do you know the way? This was a wise decision because it gives this group of Mandalorians a bit more complexity to them. It's not just physical locations and designs that need to be detailed, but also a group's philosophy and culture. Adding this new sect of Mandalorians not only better serves the story, but also the mythos of Star Wars. There are also a bunch of other minor details that I could get into further, like how all the Jawas get ecstatic over eating an egg, or how Quill has his own moral code that is fresh for Star Wars, but I would be basically repeating the same reasons I stated for the aspects of the world I have already talked about. The Mandalorian excels at making the universe feel real. Not only that, but also making this contained world feel like it's a part of the Star Wars universe while also different from what we've seen already. The first three episodes do a phenomenal job at all of that. So let's move on to chapters 4, 5, and 6. Each one of these chapters takes place in a new location we haven't seen in the series yet. Chapter 4 takes place on this luscious forest type planet, Chapter 5 takes place on Tatooine, and Chapter 6 takes place on a New Republic prison transport. This was a good decision by the writers to add a variety to the season. If the entire show took place on one or two planets, the world building could get stale and not take advantage of the universe that is Star Wars. Having these planets adds a variety to the show that the movies can't get away with. If Star Wars movie spends too much time on a handful of different planets, then the pacing would be terrible. Not many people remember that there are only 6 planets in the entire original trilogy, and 8 if you wanted to include both Death Stars. But in a series that is 8 episodes long, you can go to 1 or 2 planets an episode and the show won't feel like you're on speed like with The Rise of Skywalker. So let's talk about Chapter 4. The world building in Chapter 4 is just as great as the first 3 episodes. Not only is this simply a new planet we haven't seen before, but we are introduced to so many different social layers of this planet. There's this village that the main plot takes place in, the village has a bunch of different diverse people who don't know how to fight and defend themselves, there are also these bandits who are made up of these dog looking aliens. I like the idea of these bandits, but the design of the species just looks weird and uninspired. Let's just put the face of a bulldog on a man and there you go. I would have liked a more unique design of the species, but it's not too much of a 
a big deal. We also get this little pub type place where people chill and are far removed from the threat of the bandits. Adding diversity to a planet goes a long way in making the planet feel real. If you only see one location or culture on a planet, it's hard to picture that it's a real place that people actually live on, thus limiting the imagination of the audience. The pub has some of these creatures that are kind of cute. It seems very peaceful, a completely different vibe than what we had seen in the first three chapters. I love how in a universe where Coruscant exists, a town like this place can also exist. Now with the bandits, there isn't much development. I do like how they have an ATST. I've always liked when stories that take place after a war still feel the ramifications of that war. The entire fight scene with the ATST was fantastic and perfectly represented the tone of the series. This isn't the movies where teddy bears can take out ATSTs left and right. Overall, not a perfect job, but a pretty good job of world building in episode 4. Let's move on to episode 5. I think the world building and tone in this episode is pretty awful, not gonna lie. And it's not simply that they return to Tatooine, we just don't learn anything new about the planet. Oh, he arrives on Tatooine with the same camera shots as A New Hope. He lands in the same type of docking bay that the Millennium Falcon was in. They go to the same bar that Luke met Han in, and they literally have to sit in the exact same seat that Han shot Greedo in. If only one or two of these callbacks happened, that would be okay. But four of them? The world building here is relying too much on nostalgia and it distracts from the story the Mandalorian is trying to tell. And outside all the familiar imagery, the only new location that we get is a random cliffside in the middle of the desert. Boring. The only piece of world building I appreciate here is with the Tusken Raiders. It was honestly, at the time, the most they've been developed in the canon. Since then we've gotten Mando Chapter 7 and the first two chapters of Boba Fett that really fleshed out the Tusken Raiders, so in comparison this episode doesn't do much. Overall, lackluster world building. Chapter 6, on the other hand, does a much better job. The entirety of this episode takes place on just two ships. Since this is the only time in the series an episode does not take place on a planet at all, it's actually a fresh set piece for this season. The ship in the beginning does a decent job at feeling unique. We get some hints towards Mando's past, and there's a good amount of diversity in this episode. With our main crew of people, we got a human, a Twi'lek, a Deveronian, and a droid. There are also a few subtle lines of dialogue in this episode that enhance the world just a little bit more. Like when Mayfeld refers to Xeon as a twee. Crazy twee. To some this is nothing, but to me it makes the Star Wars universe feel more alive. I love the location of a prison in space. It's something I don't believe I've seen in Star Wars. We get these new looking droids and the flickering lights at the end of the episode was an awesome set piece. This episode doesn't do much world building, but it doesn't really need to. The jobs of chapters 4 through 6 was to expand the scope of the show, introduce us to new locations, new characters, and new cultures, and for the most part these middle episodes episodes did a great job. With the middle chapters out of the way, let's look into chapters 7 and 8. The final two chapters of the season are a return to where the season began off. In terms of physical locations, we don't get anything new, but with the way the story is set up, that is perfectly fine. Not every episode needs to introduce a new location or a new culture. The final act of a story is when the world building is set aside and the focus is entirely on the characters and their stories. There isn't much time to devote to world building here, but there are effective ways it can be done. My favorite chapter in the entire series, chapter 15 was the second to last episode of season 2, and it did a phenomenal job of world building, so it's not impossible. The world building in these two episodes pretty much all has to do with the Empire, and a little bit to do with the Mandalorians. We get our first real look at the Empire in chapter 7. I like how the Empire here has different troops within their ranks, we get the regular stormtroopers, we got some death troopers from Rogue One, and we even got these flame trooper looking things we haven't seen in the movies or shows before. You could argue that what I'm about to say here is more of a reflection of Moff Gideon himself than the Empire as a whole, but the way they just disposed of the client was an effective way of illustrating what the Empire is really like. They are ruthless, cunning, and will do whatever it takes to get the job done. The way the TIE Fighter landed here was something we hadn't seen before, and I'm a fan. The world building with Mando and the Armorer was a great addition to this sect of the Mandalorian culture. He and Baby Yoda are now part of a clan, and it's Mando's job to deliver him to his home, setting 
up the entire plot of season 2. There were a few little details in these episodes that enhanced the overall experience for me, like how Cara Dune is fighting at the pub in the beginning of the episode, it adds layers to the town introduced in chapter 4. The bird type creatures in chapter 7 also added some layers to Navarro, but the best detail was the tease with the Darksaber at the end. A big rule of writing within a franchise is that you shouldn't have to consume external material to understand what's going on. I do think a post credit scene or a last scene tease is an exception though. Casual Star Wars viewers would say, ooh that's a lightsaber but we've never seen that kind of lightsaber before. I want to learn more. And the more devoted Star Wars fans would be like, oh shit that's the motherfucking Darksaber! How did Bo-Katan lose it? Where is she now? OMG! G -G 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 -G. It was a great tease that leaves us with a lot of questions about the Mandalorians and the future of the Empire. Overall, the world building of the Mandalorian Season 1 was pretty damn good. Was it perfect? No. But it was definitely a step in the right direction after the sequels pretty much ignored world building altogether. What I want to do is rate each of these three parts out of 10 and then average them together for a final score on the season. So if I had to rate the world building and tone of The Mandalorian Season 1, I would probably give it an 8.5 out of 10. If Chapter 5 wasn't so bad and the final episodes did a slightly better job then it could have been in the 9 range, but I think an 8.5 is a fair and good score. In this part, we're going to be talking about the characters. Now what do I mean by talking about the characters? As I stated in part 1, part 2 will be about the characters and part 3 will be about the story. So in this part, I'm solely going to talk about the characters and their personalities and how they interact with each other. In part 3, I'm going to talk about the overall story of the season and how the characters arcs play into that. So this part isn't going to dive too deep into the character arcs, but I'm sure it will be touched on. Now, The Mandalorian Season 1 has a bunch of characters. It's not like a movie where there are maybe 8-ish important characters that the story depends on. Since this is a series, there are new characters appearing in each episode. Some appear in more than one episode, and others appear in only one. I'm going to divide the characters of this season into three different categories. Category 1 is the main characters. This is obviously just Mando and Baby Yoda. Category 2 are the supporting characters. These are going to be Cara Dune, Queen, Wheel, IG-11, Grief Karga, and Moff Gideon. Category 3 will be the recurring characters. These characters usually are just in one episode or play a smaller part in a few episodes. This will include the Client, the Armorer, Taro Calican, Fennec Shand, and the entire crew in Chapter 6. I'm not going to talk too much about the Category 3 characters individually because there simply isn't too much to them. Yes, a character like Migs Mayfeld becomes essential in Season 2, but in Season 1 he doesn't do much. So I'm going to start with category 3, then 2, then 1. Are the characters of The Mandalorian Season 1 compelling? Do they live up to the characters from the movies? Will these characters stand the test of time? Are we invested in the future of these characters? Let's write a blurg, throw Mando into a jail cell, and drink some spotchka, and let's talk about the characters of The Mandalorian Season 1. Let's begin with the recurring characters. Let's start with Fennec Shand. A lot of people love this character. I mean, she's cool, a nice contrast to the bounty hunting ways of Mando, but to be honest, I think the entirety of her popularity exists because of the actress Ming-Na Wen. I like her, I liked her in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and I've liked a lot of the voice acting work she's done. But the sole reason Fennec is in the show is because they eventually want to pair her with Boba Fett. In the sole episode she's in this season, she snipes at Mando and Taro a few times, gets held at gunpoint, and then dies. She serves no purpose in the story. And even in the second season, she's just there because she needs to be in the Book of Boba Fett. Speaking of Chapter 5, let's talk about Taro Calican. He's easily the worst character in the series. His personality is one of incompetence and annoyance. His only redeeming quality was when he killed Fennec. Many argue that it was intentional to have his character be so widely disliked, but I have to disagree. Joffrey from Game of Thrones is a character that was designed to be disliked. Taro doesn't fill that same role. He would be a better character if Mando actually learned something from his encounter with Taro, but he doesn't. Taro is not once mentioned ever again, and he doesn't have any impact on Mando's story going forward. A character that does have an impact on Mando's story is the Armorer. She serves a very specific role for this series, and that is to educate Mando and the audience on this sect of Mandalorian culture. In a fantasy or a science fiction series, there needs to be an effective way to expose information to the audience. Usually that can be in the way of a mentor, like Gandalf or Obi-Wan. The Armorer 
Armorer loosely fits that character trope. She doesn't have a personality, but she doesn't really need to. Mandalorian culture can be complex to people who haven't watched the Clone Wars or Rebels, so her subtle way of providing exposition works for the season. There's also a mystery to her that I find to be fascinating. Where did she go after the first season? Will she have a role in season 3? She's the most knowledgeable about this sect of the Mandalorians, and since we are invested in wanting to learn more about the culture, we are also invested in her by default. The flip side to the Armorer is the Client. Similar to the Armorer, the Client has a lot of mystery surrounding him. Throughout the first six episodes, he's our main window into the Empire. And since the Empire fell in Return of the Jedi, and we know the remnants of the Empire eventually become the First Order, the audience is heavily invested in what the Empire's plans are. Werner Herzog is fantastic in this role. He gives off this knowledgeable yet loyal vibe. He's not someone we fear, but someone we are invested in. Why does he want the child? What is his relationship to the First Order? Was he simply just a puppet? It's a shame that he's dead, but I enjoyed his presence while it lasted. And lastly, for this part of the recurring characters, let's talk about the Chapter 6 crew. I don't have a better name for them. There's always a lot of talk about the scum and villainy in Star Wars, but this is genuinely the scum and villainy of Star Wars. Each character of the group serves a different purpose. Mayfeld is the leader and kind of the funny one. Gion is the skilled Twi'lek who's also crazy. The Deveronian is simply the muscle of the group, and Zero the Droid is the mechanical one who runs the show behind the scenes. Since all the members of the crew are different, they stand out to the audience and become more memorable. The group collectively lets us learn more about Mando. The big thing in this episode is that Mando does questionable things, but has a moral line he does not cross. The group, on the other hand, does not. The killing of the New Republic officer says everything we need to know about Mando and how he contrasts with the others. And that's what effective recurring characters should do. They should challenge the protagonist in a way that fleshes out their character. And the group in Chapter 6 does that perfectly. Yes, there are other characters I could talk about, like the Widow or the Curly-Haired Lady, but these are the ones I wanted to focus on the most. Overall, the recurring characters in this season are pretty good, not great. Let's move on to the supporting characters. The supporting characters are what often make or break a show. A show can have a semi-interesting main character, but if the supporting characters and the villains are great, then the series will be elevated to new heights. Let's begin by talking about IG-11. Of all the supporting characters, he's probably the least important, but he does play an important role. There's obviously two versions of this character, and that difference is what makes Mando's droid-hating character arc work so well. IG-11 is simply just a funny character. They manage to channel the K2SO level of charisma here. Did you know that wasn't me? There's a naivety to droids that can either be annoying or incredibly comedic, and IG-11 is way more on the comedic side. Like when he was threatening to blow himself up in the pilot episode, that shit was hilarious. Any character that is this funny is bound to be well-liked, and IG-11 is definitely one of those characters. His death scene and sacrifice is probably one of the most underrated death scenes in the franchise. His loyalty to Baby Yoda and the way he saved Mando when he was injured made the audience not simply just like the character, but made us care for him. Easily the most important aspect of his character is that he allows Mando to get over his hatred of droids. Supporting characters need to help the main characters grow, and IG-11 definitely accomplished that. Let's move on to Grief Karga. Of all the supporting characters in the series, he's probably my least favorite. He spends most of the time as the face of the bounty hunting guild. He doesn't really challenge Mando or add much to the story emotionally. He serves as exposition most of the time. Grief Karga doesn't have much depth to him either. We don't know much about his past or his personality. He's not a bad character. I enjoy his presence for the most part. I just feel there was potential for them to do a little bit more. But it's not a huge hindrance on the series. Up next, we got Moff Gideon. I would say Moff Gideon is a good villain, but not a great one. When he shows up in Chapter 7, he definitely makes his presence felt. I love the way he simply disposed of the client. It showed us his ruthlessness. When he starts talking about each character and their backstories, it shows us he's more of a strategic threat than he is of a physical one. We start to ask ourselves, how does he know this about our characters? Who is providing him with this information? A character that is always one step ahead is threatening to our main protagonist, and that is what Moff Gideon is. His character probably would have been more effective if we got a tease of him in chapters 
one or three. Maybe the client mentions something about Moff Gideon and how he needs to be feared. So when he shows up, we're like, oh shit, this man is definitely someone to fear. I'll inevitably touch on him a bit more in season two, since he does a lot more there. But here in season one, he's a good villain. Again, not great. Contrasting our Imperial leader, we got former Rebel Shock Trooper Kara Dune. I shouldn't have to say this, but I will. My upcoming comments on the character have nothing to do with Gina Carano's political stances. She could have murdered a bunch of children, and that wouldn't change my mind about the character of Cara Dune. With that out of the way, Cara Dune was one of my favorite characters in this show. They did an excellent job of using the rest of the lore to build her character. We find out she was a rebel and that she hates the Empire. This could have been satisfactory enough for us to understand her motivations for wanting to help Mando in chapters 7 and 8. But when Moff Gideon mentions she was from Alderaan, that is a great character decision. She does need to give some emotional speech about how she felt so close to Alderaan and how she lost her whole family when it was blown up. All we needed to know is that she was from Alderaan and her hatred for the Empire is 100% justified. The character of Cara Dune is a fresh type of character we haven't seen in the franchise. Cara Dune is a woman that can kick some serious ass. Yeah, we got intelligent and dominant women like Padme and Leia in the movies, but they were never physical threats like Cara Dune. But we see Cara Dune get punched and kicked a lot and she could take every bit of it. Again, I should make it clear that not every woman in the franchise needs to be like Cara Dune. I'm just saying we've never seen a character like Cara Dune before in live action, so her presence is fresh for the franchise. She has a great relationship with Mando. She helps him open up a bit. He began the series as closed off as we can see him in, but as he meets more people, he opens up, and Cara Dune played a big part in that. Now, as much as I like the character of Cara Dune, she isn't even remotely in the same conversation as Quill. Quill is hands down my favorite character in this series, and is one of the best supporting characters in the entire franchise. Quill is a simple Ugnaught who was enslaved by the Empire for so long, and now all he wants is peace. And when he asks for Mando's help in Chapter 1, it's not because he has some personal vendetta against the bandits, he just wants peace in his town. Quill is as noble and selfless as you can be. When Mando asks for help in Chapter 2, Quill doesn't question it. He is more than glad to help out. I know I said the Armorer was the mentor figure to Mando, but you could make the argument that Quill is too. This may be a hot take, but outside of Darth Vader and maybe Kanan Jarrus, Quill has the best death scene in the franchise. All the death scenes in the series usually come from some sort of sacrifice, but not Quill. He was a man who wanted to live the rest of his life in peace, but because he is a selfless and good-hearted person, he died trying to protect Baby Yoda. It's heartbreaking, tragic, and devastating. We haven't really seen a death like that in Star Wars, and boy was it powerful. I honestly don't want to dive too much into Quill because I'm 100% going to make a video on him one day, but all you need to know is that he is an amazing character. The supporting characters in this series are great. Grief Karga isn't amazing, and Moff Gideon could have been a better villain, but none of them are remotely even close to being bad characters. IG-11, Cara Dune, and especially Quill add so much to the series, and without them, the season wouldn't even be remotely as good. But even if the supporting characters are as good as they are, none of that matters if the main characters aren't great. Let's talk about Mando and Baby Yoda, aka Grogu. It should be stated off the bat that Baby Yoda isn't really a character, he's a plot device. He doesn't really have any personality traits, I mean, he likes having fun, sure, but he's a baby, you can't expect too much from him. I will say this though, and I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but conceptually, the idea of Baby Yoda was the smartest decision Star Wars as a franchise has made since the original Yoda in 1980. As I stated in the beginning of part 1, I was concerned that this series would struggle to capture the casual audience, but Baby Yoda does a perfect job at capturing all audiences. From a casual viewer's point of view, Baby Yoda is simply just cute. It's ingrained in human nature to have a soft spot for babies. Baby Yoda is so cute that he has exploded in popularity. I have met people who haven't even seen the show The Mandalorian wearing Baby Yoda merch. Baby Yoda is probably the single most popular character in the franchise that didn't appear in the original film. Now what makes him so great for the core fans? Well, any hardcore fan of the franchise knows how important important Yoda species is. We've only seen Yoda and Yaddle. There's also this mystery that surrounds the character that fans have speculated about for decades. Keep in mind, we still do not know the name of Yoda species and probably never will. This is the first time we've seen someone new of this species since 1999. By nature, the hardcore audience is going to wonder what the implications are of this. Also, whenever a story connects to the Force, it automatically becomes more interesting to the hardcore fans. That is the genius behind Baby Yoda. Saying this 
decision to include a Baby Yoda is anything but perfect is an understatement. That's really all I have to say about Baby Yoda, so let's conclude part two by talking about the titular character, the Mandalorian himself. The characterization of Mando in this series is fantastic, but easily the most impressive thing about his character is how well Pedro Pascal is able to express emotion through a helmet. I know he might not technically be under the helmet, but you understand what I'm trying to say. Chapter 3 is the best example of this, but all throughout the series you can tell exactly what Mando is thinking without any dialogue. If you want me to fall in love with your story, I need to be able to learn as much as I can about the character without any dialogue being spoken. That's why I think Wally is one of the best films ever made. It's a perfect example of show don't tell. Mando has many layers to him that most of the other Star Wars protagonists lack. By chapter 3, we already know so much about this character and why he is doing the things he's doing. He never needs to say it. But based on the flashbacks and the visual storytelling, we know the reason he cares for Baby Yoda so much is because he doesn't want Baby Yoda to suffer the same pain he felt when he was younger. It's never said, but the directing and the acting do all the talking. I'll elaborate a little bit more on this in part 3. But what is Mando's personality like? In the first few chapters, he's very closed off. In the first 10 minutes of the first episode, he only has like 3 or 4 lines of dialogue. But as the series progresses, we learn more about his personality. He's very empathetic. He has strong morals as we've seen in chapter 6. He's loyal, both to his Mandalorian family and to his new friends he's made along the way. This isn't technically a personality trait, but I love how Mando isn't the best bounty hunter we've ever seen. Is he good at his job? Yes! But we've seen him get beaten up a lot throughout the entire season. He's not invincible like other characters in the franchise. He loses fights and battles, and that's what makes a character feel more three-dimensional, more relatable. Mando's best trait is easily his compassion. The lengths he goes to just to keep Baby Yoda safe is admirable. Mando may not have the most lovable personality, but his actions make him a lovable character, and that's all a story can ask from its main character. There's a lot more I can say about Mando, but I'm gonna dive far deeper into that in part 3. The show's dynamic duo of Mando and Baby Yoda are as iconic as anything in Star Wars. We all know Baby Yoda will be around for decades to come, but I cannot wait to learn more about Mando and his direction in The Mandalorian going forward. What are my final thoughts on the characters of The Mandalorian Season 1? As I did with Part 1, I'm gonna give this aspect of The Mandalorian Season 1 a rating 1 through 10. My rating for the characters will be a 9.5 out of 10. Most of the characters are fantastic, and they stand out in the sandbox that is this corner of the Star Wars galaxy. Had Chapter 5 been better, then this would probably be a 10, but currently it is a 9.5. In the final part of this three-part series, we will be talking about the story. So far, I have covered world building and the characters. When it comes to the story of The Mandalorian Season 1, the season is divided into three acts. The first act would be chapters 1 through 3. This act sets up the main characters and what the overall plot of the story will be. The second act, chapters 4 through 6, are kinda the rising action. They should develop the characters and the threats more. The final act, which is chapters 7 and 8 is the final act. This is the climax of the story and all our character arcs are resolved in some way. So that is how I'm going to break down this part of the series. So how well do the characters mix with the story? Is the message of the season one that is compelling and honors the legacy of Star Wars? Do the characters go on meaningful arcs? How well does each act serve the story? Well, let's track down some bounties, fight off some bandits, reprogram some droids, and let's talk about the story of The Mandalorian Season 1. As I said earlier, Act 1 needs to set up the characters, their arcs, and the overall story. The first three chapters do a fantastic job at all of that. What is interesting about these first three chapters is that they introduce two arcs for Mando to go on. One will be resolved by the end of Chapter 3, and the other will be resolved at the end of the season. The more important arc that he goes on has to do with Baby Yoda. His arc is all about finding a purpose and doing what's right with that purpose. The season begins with Mando. Mando only caring about one thing, his job. He collects bounties and asks for more when he's done. A big theme of this video is show don't tell. Almost every time a story point needs to be addressed, you don't just hear a character say some line of dialogue that is important, you need to show that through the character's actions. Mando only cares about his job in the beginning. How do we know this? Well, he doesn't simply say, all I care about is my job and nothing else. We see how emotionally distant he is from everyone in the first half 
half of chapter one. He's not interested in making friends or helping other people. All he cares about is collecting bounties and helping other Mandalorians. When Grief Karga tells him he should take a break, all he says is that he wants his next job. His mannerisms in this first chapter perfectly illustrate his personality at the beginning of his arc. Another important story point that needs to be established is why a character undergoes a certain change. It is bad storytelling to see a character undergo a change for no reason at all. The way this season provides a foundation for both his character arcs is through the montages of his past. We learned that when he was a child, his parents were killed by separatist droids and that he was saved by other Mandalorians. How do these flashbacks set up his character arcs? With his character arc with Baby Yoda, it tells us why he cares about the child so much and why he takes him away from the Empire. When Mando was a child, his parents were killed and he felt alone. No one to love or care for him. I'm assuming that even though he found the other Mandalorians, they never provided him with that love or care that his parents gave him. When he sees this child inside a small container with a droid aiming a gun at him, he instantly puts himself in the child's shoes. Because, like Baby Yoda, he was once a child inside a small container with a droid aiming a gun at him. We don't need to hear Mando say how he doesn't want the child to be alone, or how his backstory is similar to the child's. These flashbacks and the visual storytelling do all the work, and that is what great storytelling is. Now, what is his second character arc? Well, it's his relationship with droids. We see that he hates droids, and the reason why is because they killed his parents and almost killed him when he was younger. This arc about his relationship with the droids isn't essential to the overall story of the season, but it's a great way to add another layer to the character and see how that character grows throughout the season. Now, of course, once he encounters Baby Yoda, he doesn't instantly change his mind about running away from the Empire. Character change takes time, and if it is rushed, then the story won't be compelling. Chapter 2 is all about building that connection between Mando and Baby Yoda. Many called Chapter 2 filler when it first came out, but that is completely incorrect. Without Chapter 2, Mando's change of heart in Chapter 3 doesn't work. When Baby Yoda saves Mando from the Mudhorn, it further builds Mando's care for him, which is all in service of what I think is the most important scene in the entire series. Chapter 3 is a masterclass in directing and storytelling. The whole point of this chapter is that Mando gives a child back to the Empire, he feels immense guilt and regret, and goes back to save him. If we don't believe that this character feels guilty for his actions, then the whole season falls apart. It should also be noted that Mando wears a helmet the entire time. Acting is like 90% about what you do with your face, and most of that has to do with your eyes. Mando doesn't have a face or eyes that the audience can see, so all of his acting is through body language. Just through body language, we know exactly what Mando is thinking. When Baby Yoda gets carried off, we can tell that Mando feels guilty for what he is doing. But the most important scene in the season is when Mando is about to leave Navarro. This scene is a masterclass in directing. Based off the ball that Baby Yoda was playing with earlier, we know exactly what Mando is thinking when he is putting it back on the lever. The way he just stares at it and the speed at which he turns the ship on and back off again tells the audience Mando regrets what he did and he is going back to save the child. All these little moments throughout the first three chapters do a fantastic job at helping Mando go through this arc. He begins the series as a loner who doesn't care for much. He meets a child that reminds him a lot of his own past. He becomes very close and begins to care for the child. He gives the child away, realizes what he did was wrong, and sacrifices his entire job just to save a child he just met. All of this is completely earned, and that is why the first act of The Mandalorian Season 1 is fantastic. Let's take a look at Act 2. With Mando's main character arc completed in Chapter 3, what is there for him to do for the rest of the season? Yes, he still hates droids, but that is not enough for the season to stay compelling. Mando in these last five chapters actually doesn't go on the standard character arc. He goes on a flat arc. A standard character arc is one where the characters change. The character has a flaw at the beginning of the story, and by the end the character realizes their flaw and changes. A flat arc is where the character does not change 
change, but their beliefs are challenged. This is basically what Luke goes through in Return of the Jedi. From the beginning to the end of the story, Luke doesn't really change much. He doesn't overcome a certain flaw throughout that movie. Luke has a belief, and that belief is that there is good in his father, and he will stop at nothing to bring him back to the light side. Throughout the movie, Luke is tested by this, mostly by Vader and the Emperor. Luke is given many chances throughout the story to give up on his father and either kill him or take his place as the Emperor's new apprentice. But throughout all of that, he sticks to his beliefs. And because he showed his father unconditional compassion, Vader turns back to the light side and dies as Anakin Skywalker. So with The Mandalorian Season 1, Mando now holds the belief that the safety of the child is of utmost importance. Keeping the child safe is his number one priority. Mando could have easily given Baby Yoda back to the Empire, and everyone would stop trying to kill him. But in his eyes, it is worth it to risk his life to keep Baby Yoda safe. So how well does Act 2 progress Mando's flat arc? It accomplishes this by showing him everywhere he goes, the child will not be safe as long as there is a bounty still after him. In Chapter 4, Mando tries to find a village that is safe for the child, but a bounty hunter still finds him. In Chapter 5 and 6, Mando goes on a mission to earn some credits. But while he is doing so, the people who he is working with will backstab him if it means to collect the bounty for Baby Yoda. The payoff for all of this is in Chapter 7, so I'll get to that a little bit later in the video. How effective of a job do these episodes do at challenging Mando and his beliefs? I would say they do a decent job. Chapters 4 and 6 are very entertaining and do a good job at showing Mando's other beliefs, but when it comes to specifically protecting Baby Yoda, it doesn't do a great job. Each episodes have their own contained stories, and only Chapter 4 has to actively do with Baby Yoda. Chapter 5 and 6 have to do with Mando helping other people with their job, and during that job, Baby Yoda's life is threatened. The season would have been much better off if chapters 5 and 6 had a more active role in Baby Yoda's safety. But where these chapters do deserve credit has to do with consequences. One of my cardinal rules of storytelling is that actions should always have consequences. Too many times, characters will attempt really stupid missions or commit certain acts that have immense importance, but following these actions, characters don't face the consequences. This is one of the aspects I really appreciated about The Last Jedi. With The Mandalorian, Mando went back on his deal with the Empire and broke many rules established by the Bounty Hunting Guild. Because of his actions in Chapter 3, he has to face the consequences of that in Chapters 4 through 6. And those consequences is that people will always be after Baby Yoda and that he will never be safe. But with that being said, these episodes still lack in many ways, especially in the impact on Baby Yoda that I mentioned before. I could dive deep into each episode individually and explain why chapters 4 and 6 are very entertaining and why chapter 5 is easily the worst episode in the series, but that wouldn't be productive at all. Final thoughts on Act 2? They did a decent job at best to progress the story, but there was a lot of room for improvement. Let's talk about the final two episodes in the season. How good of a job do they do at wrapping up the story and the arcs that Mando has gone on? Well, just like Act 1, Act 3 is phenomenal. In the second act, Mando learns that Baby Yoda is never safe. So what he does in Chapter 7 is he decides to make a decision to confront the Empire. The reason this works so well is because Mando is making an active decision. In storytelling, it is very important that our protagonist is an active character. An active character is a character that makes decisions that reveals their personality. A passive character is a character that reacts to events happening. An example of a passive character would be Jin Erso from Rogue One. For most of the story, she doesn't make her own decisions, she just reacts to events around her. Mando here is making the active decision to recruit his friends he's made along the way to go fight the Empire. This also wonderfully adds to Mando's flat arc. He's not going to continue to just run around anymore. He's going to challenge the Empire and risk his life to keep Baby Yoda safe going forward. Piggybacking on the consequences topic I addressed in part 2, Mando faces immense consequences in these final two chapters. We learn that because of what he did in chapter 3, almost all the Mandalorians were killed. Mando also attempts a really risky mission. The consequences of that mission are that he almost dies, Baby Yoda almost dies, Quill does die, and IG-11 also dies. Not only is his life at stake, but his new friends' lives are at stake as well, and some of them lose their lives. Quill's death is a perfect example 
example of actions having consequences. Not only do these final two chapters do a good job at concluding Mando's flat arc, but they also do a great job of wrapping up his droid hating arc. Mando begins chapter 7 not trusting IG-11. He doesn't believe a droid can be reprogrammed for good. However, in chapter 8, IG-11 proves to Mando that he can be reprogrammed for good. Mando emphasizes in pretty much every episode how important it is that he never removes his helmet. Removing his helmet would mean he is no longer a Mandalorian, aka he will lose his entire culture. In the moments on his potential deathbed, Mando not only overcomes his hatred for droids, but he is willing to show one his face. This was such a great way for Mando to fulfill this character arc. Genius, if you ask me. Now, as well as these character arcs are resolved, do they send a powerful message? What is the theme of The Mandalorian Season 1? The Mandalorian, just like the Skywalker Saga, is a study about the importance of family. Mando began the season with no real family. Yeah, he had the other Mandalorians, but he never felt like they were his real family. Once Baby Yoda enters the picture, he becomes his surrogate father. Mando holds the belief that sticking by his friends and family is more important than anything else. He constantly risked his life to protect the child, and by the end of the season he becomes a better and happier person because of it. Had Mando stayed down his old path of just constantly bounty hunting, he would probably live the remainder of his life as a depressed man. But he found a purpose and stood by that purpose throughout the season. This series honors everything that George Lucas stood for, and I couldn't be happier about it. The Mandalorian Season 1 effectively tells a story about a man who is alone, who finds a family, and how that family makes him a better person. Just like the first two parts of the series, I will be ranking the story of The Mandalorian out of 10. My score for the story of this season will be a 9 out of 10. The first and third acts are a masterclass in storytelling. They each deserve a 10 out of 10 and do a wonderful job at beginning and concluding Mando's character arcs. With the story of the season struggles, is with the second act. Had the episodes played a more active role in Mando protecting Baby Yoda, then the story could be potentially a 9.5 or a 10. But because they don't, it drags the score down to a 9. With all three parts finally concluded, we will average them together to give the season a final score. The final score of The Mandalorian Season 1 will be a 9 out of 10. The season is not perfect, but damn does it do a great job. And because of the success of this season, the future of the franchise is filled with optimism. I hope you you guys enjoyed this series. I love diving deep into movies and analyzing what makes them so great. Let me know in the comments what other movies or seasons of shows you would like to see me cover. Thank you everyone so much for watching another one of my videos. Don't forget to unite the Claude Squad and I will see you guys next time.